There's a few things I wanted to talk about. The first is related to additional properties of Hamiltonian flows. In addition to the volume being preserved, there are these other things that are also preserved. And those are worth mentioning at least, um, even if I don't go into much detail right now. And then I'm gonna talk about cyclic coordinates or what are called ignorable coordinates. And this typically gets introduced first when you're talking about Lagrangians and it's related to um, symmetries of the Lagrangian that are related to conserved quantities, conserved generalized uh, momenta. But I'll do a brief review of that because it sort of ties into how we simplify Hamiltonian systems to make them easier as we sort of create ignorable coordinates and create constants of motion just by doing a change of variables. And that's part of its, uh, it's part of the charm of the Hamiltonian world. Continuing from something I mentioned last time, it's often called Liouville's theorem, but the idea of the, uh, the flow of a Hamiltonian system, which I think means I have to mention what a flow is. So by a flow, and here I'm gonna just, I'm gonna write a general n-dimensional ODE, where it doesn't depend on time here, but we, the idea of a flow, this would be called up here, sometimes people will refer to this as the flow, but I think it's more accurate to call this the velocity field or vector field, right? It's also a set of, differential equations, but it describes a, you know, in, in the space, it's a bunch of vectors. And if we had some initial condition, we know that it will evolve to always be tangent to these vectors. And you can think of not just points, but entire regions that then if you follow them under the flow, they will evolve. So the flow or the flow map is a map of the phase space to itself. We often write it this way. This is a phi sub t. So it would take in uh, points in the phase space. Here, Rn is the phase space. And it gives us other points or collections, sets in the phase space. So you could think of this as you take an initial condition and this gives you where that evolves to after a time t. So sometimes we say you know, x, not maps to V of T, X not. So this X of T is really, think of it as this, it's this operation that takes in points and tells you where they go. And it's a, it's a useful construct to have this idea of a flow map. So if I have a, a region, maybe I'll call this region D, then it would map to, you let this thing evolve after some amount of time, and maybe it evolves into some other shape. This would be, you might be tempted to call this D of at time T, but also you could call it V of T taking in the, the region D and telling you where it is. So this would be in some sense, the initial region. And then this is the, you know, that same region after flowing for a time t. So hopefully that's, that's clear. I like to think of a fluid, right? If we put a bunch of dye in a fluid, maybe some magenta dye, and then you were able to follow that patch as it moves through the fluid and look at where it is at some late, later time, 
that would be phi of t. But we can now think of this as this is an, an actual map. And so maps are mathematical objects that uh, can have properties. Uh, here I was thinking of just a general ODE. When we specialize to uh, Hamiltonian ODEs, then this will have certain types of properties. All right, so if we specialize to a Hamiltonian system, x dot equals, and the way I guess I wrote it last time is this that J matrix, the canonical symplectic matrix times the gradient of H. And here, uh, hopefully this isn't too confusing, but now I'm saying this is in 2N. It's, all, it, it's going to be an even number, all right? So now we've specialized to this form for the type of vector field that we're looking at. The flow map has certain properties. And we mentioned one of them last time when we talked about the divergence-free nature of the the vector field that being divergent this being divergence free leads to the map being volume preserving um, sometimes we'll write phi of t and just to emphasize that this comes from a hamiltonian uh, with hamiltonian function h maybe i'll put a subscript h but I'm, i might forget to put the h so this and i'll just put a dot here like it takes in something we don't even, maybe it takes in points, maybe it takes in lines, curves, maybe it takes in entire volumes. That's the nice thing about just sort of divide, defining it as a, this general map object um, is this is two N dimensional volume preserving. And like I said, that just follows directly from the divergence free um, nature of the this vector field up here, also called Liouville's theorem, this whole thing. But there's actually more to it. Because there's a there, especially in a large dimensional space, there's a lot of ways that a uh, that you could have something be volume preserving. And this is volume preservation is actually just one of the properties. So there are other things called the the integral invariance of Poincaré and Carton. And what this says, um, it's probably best said in terms of an example, like let's pick N to be three. So we've got a three degree of freedom system then actually one of the integral invariants is just the volume preservation. So if we have a blob, um, I'm gonna try to, I think I have a picture of a blob. Looks kind of like a brain, but just think of it, uh, this is a piece of the, if N equals three degrees of freedom, then we have a six dimensional phase space, right? So this is a blob or volume. This is a six, dimensional volume in uh, phase space. So it will be preserved if we let this blob evolve, the volume will stay the same. It might change its shape dramatically, right? So maybe after a while, this will become something extremely convoluted and weird in six dimensions, but it'll maintain its six dimensional volume. And it's hard to wrap your mind around six dimensional volumes. So that's one thing, right? Volume, so 6D volume is preserved under the flow. 
And then that, that's something you could actually numerically check if you were to just plug in, like this shows actually a grid of points, kind of a mesh. If you had a, uh, a cloud of points in six dimensions, then you could estimate the volume initially, and then you could estimate the volume after you've evolved for some amount of time, and the volume should stay the same if your um, numerical integrator is, is accurate. But there are other things. These integral invariants of Poincaré Carton say that in addition to the 6D volume being preserved, there will be, and this is, this is pretty cool. Well, I think it's cool. Um, if we look at the projection of this, and I'm gonna do some, like, some kind of cartoony projections onto some individual phase spaces here. Uh, I mean, the symplectic planes or canonical planes. So Q1, P1, and then I'll have actually Q2, P2. Because this is a Hamiltonian system, a canonical Ham Hamiltonian system, there's always going to be uh, three Qs, so three coordinates, and then there are three corresponding momenta. And the projections, there'll be some kind of projection onto each of these. So here's the projection onto that area. Um, there'll be a projection, meaning you just, just look at those variables. And they don't all have to have the same shape. They could be pretty weird. You take this blob in the six dimensional space and then just look at what it projects to. These don't even have to be convex regions. They can have curviness to them. And the sum of the areas, the sum of the oriented areas is going to be preserved. So if this area, we'll call the area on uh, the, on this canonical plane, A1. And I, by oriented areas, I mean, like you're, you're doing an integral around it. And so this, the areas can have, uh, can be positive or they can be negative. This is area two and this is area three. So one of the integral invariants of Poincaré Carton is that the sum of these three So in this case, right, we've got A1 plus A2 plus A3 has to be a constant. Just like over here, the 60 volume is preserved. So the 60 volume is a constant. Whatever it was initially, it stays that way, no matter how this evolves. So these, these different areas will change. Like at this later time, if I were to sketch the projection, each of the projections may change but the sum of the oriented areas will be constant. So this is a, it's a stricter condition than just volume preservation. This implies volume preservation as part of it, but it's stricter. And that's, that's not all, that's just one of them. There are, there are other integral invariants and I'll sketch, one more just so the the previous one looked at the projection on the three canonical planes and maybe i should put that in words sum of the oriented oriented means that because it could be plus or minus is constant so some of the oriented areas sorry on the canonical planes This other one is a bit harder, but it's the, it's projections onto now four dimensions of the phase space. So this first projection, and this is hard to sketch. I mean, you know, I'm trying to sketch something that's four dimensions. Q1, P1, Q2, P2, and 
Of course, this will be some kind of 4D blob. Like I've just sort of neglected Q3 and P3. So we have that. And then we've got another projection onto another four directions, Q1, P1, uh, Q3, P3. This is another 4D projection. And then, and, and what did we leave out here? We left out uh, Q2 and P2. So in this last one, we will leave out Q1 and P1. So we'll have Q2, P2, Q3, P3. And I don't know how to draw this one, maybe something banana shaped. So these are four, these are three different 4D um, volumes, if you want. So the projected volumes onto the three possible hyperplanes. So another invariant is the sum of the oriented volumes. And these are 4D volumes projected onto the three possible QI, PI, QJ, PJ hyperplanes. And then if you think of, okay, what would be the next step? It's like the first one was just doing a bunch of 2D projections and then a 4D projection. The 6D projection would just be the entire space which means we get back to the entire volume. So the, the integral invariants of Poincaré Carton are in some sense a generalization of this volume preservation. There's something stricter than just pure volume preservation. It's a pretty strict condition on how this thing, any blob evolves. And you might say, well, well then what is the application? Well, one application could be Think of this phase blob as being your sort of unknown region of where a satellite is. You think you know not just a, a point, but you have some probability distribution. Well, how does that probability distribution evolve? It can't evolve just any old way. It has to evolve in such a way that it conserves these integral invariants. So that could be important um, if you want to track how the uh, a satellite um, moves in the field of the earth and the moon. Okay, so that's, I'll probably say something more about that later, but because I did mention the Liouville's theorem and this divergence-free nature, I thought I would mention this as well, because often this goes unmentioned, that there's actually a generalization of it. Um, that's much stricter than just volume preservation. Again, this could be numerically verified to show that your simulation is at least simulating it accurately, right? You could, you could calculate using computational power now, the sum of 4D volumes and see if things are working out. If you wanna see a real picture of a bunch of sums. So I have the same sort of schematic brain looking blue blob, but then these are three actual projections from the uh, restricted three body problems, celestial mechanics. At one instant in time, like if I were to show it at how does this evolve at a later instant in time, each of these area projections would be different, but the sum of the areas covered by the, the black dots uh, will be the same. There might be more in one projection than another, and that's what gets interesting. So it's, it's kind of like a water balloon. Uh, you know how you can squeeze a water balloon and the volume has to keep moving around. Well, now you've got a weird water balloon 
in six dimensions. And as you squeeze one part of it, uh, maybe the area grows in one direction and shrinks in another. I, I don't have good intuition about water balloons in six dimensions, but you can calculate these things. So, so that's kind of cool. Professor? Yeah. The idea that uh, you're trying to predict what the future volume might be? Well, at least put constraints on it about what the volume could be in the future. Yeah, so it, let's say this was a, an, an initial distribution from some measurement. And then later, maybe we're only able to access the Z, PZ um, area for whatever reason. Maybe our measurement is only along the Z direction. So we're able to get that. Um, then that puts constraints on what the other two projections have to be. So that's kind of makes sense where it's going. Yeah. Is it also to say that if we were to get like very accurate measurements in one direction, that the other directions are not accurate? That's correct. So it's it's a lot like the uncertainty principle. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you're not, let's say you, um, once you make the measurement, you've got a lot of accuracy, let's say in the Z, P, Z plane. So you've, you've kind of got it down as close to a point as you can. Well, after a short amount of time, well, I don't, I don't know how short, after some amount of time, your uncertainty in that area can grow just according to these uh, Poincaré integral invariants. So even though you have very little uncertainty in one of the kind of directions and its conjugate momenta, in the other directions, it could be really large. And now some of those will actually get pushed into the direction that you just measured, which then means, okay, measure that direction again. And you 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 can tighten up um, the uncertainty. So I might revisit that if I ever talk about. Uh, there's a topic. Uh, there's some other additional constraint related to this called the Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. All right. So enough of that for now. I wanted to talk about um, cyclic coordinates because we're going to build up to finding cyclic coordinates ignorable coordinates in the Hamiltonian system. So this will be a review if you've, you've taken my course that talks about the Lagrangians and also the Routh procedure. But if not, uh, it'll be a quick whirlwind tour. So things that are called cyclic coordinates, that's kind of the old terminology. The other term that is used is ignorable coordinates and that's a bit of a it's not like you can completely ignore them but this is related to the Routh or some people say Ruth Routhian I think I say Routh procedure and that uh, students guide to Lagrangians and Hamiltonians has a good little section on this. So by Hamill, section 4.6. So the, the setting, the original setting for this is the Lagrangian formalism. So let's suppose we have a Lagrangian and it's a function of N generalized coordinates and their time rates of change. So Q1 dot to Qn dot. So this is what you would get for an N degree of freedom system. So you'd have a Lagrangian that has dependence on all of those variables. But sometimes we find that the Lagrangian, let's say, doesn't depend on Qn. So that means partial L partial QN equals zero. That basically means um, there is no explicit dependence on QN, but we still have that uh, it depends on QN dot. So that nth generalized velocity is there. It just may be that we don't have any explicit dependence on that variable. 
so when we have this, then if we look at Lagrange's equations, right, we would have n Lagrange's equations, one for each of the generalized coordinates. And let's just assume for now there's no non-conservative forces or constraints. So Lagrange's equation for Qn is total derivative, so d by dt of partial L, partial Qn dot minus partial L, partial Qn equals zero. But, right, this, um, because we have no explicit dependence on Qn, this is zero. And now if we use the notation that we've developed for the Hamiltonian, that partial L, partial Qn dot is what we've called Pn. It's the you know, nth momentum. Then this would tell us that D by DT, Pn equals zero. That means that you know, in general, Pn is gonna be a function of time. And in this case, it's a constant. Pn is a constant. You could say it's a constant of motion. So we've got conservation of whatever that momentum is. So not having explicit dependence on Qn, it's, you could think of it as a, a kind of symmetry. The Lagrangian doesn't depend on Qn, so it doesn't matter what Qn is. Let's say it's you know, 1.5 or 2.6 or something. It, it doesn't matter what it is. We have a, a symmetry and that leads to a constant of motion. Yeah, I guess summing up, um, partial L partial Qn equals zero means that Pn, which is defined to be partial L partial Qn dot has the most trivial dynamics that you could ever want that Pn dot equals zero, it's constant. So yeah, like I said, conservation of the nth momentum and the terminology when you have something like this, is that uh, we say Qn is an ignorable coordinate. You, you might say, well, like, what does that mean? What do you mean we can ignore it? Well, we can end up rewriting our dynamics so that we, we literally can ignore that coordinate. We use the fact that the momentum is constant, and then we construct something called the Routhian function. So this is called the Routh procedure, or the Routhian procedure. I'll just say the Routh procedure. Um, Routh was a mathematical physicist. So the Routh procedure is that we go from, essentially, this is how I think of it, we go from an N degree of freedom system to effectively a N minus one degree of freedom system. And how do we do that? We construct something that's like the Lagrangian, but it we are able to remove the effect of the ignorable coordinate. So we do this by constructing a new function and I'll say it's Lagrangian like. And of course, you know, we take a person's name and then just add Ian. So Routhian, Routhian function. So we, we refer to this usually by capital R. 
it's going to be a function of q's through qn minus one, but not the ignorable coordinate. And that's why it gets its name, ignorable. It'll be a function of q1 uh, dot all the way to qn minus one dot. So it's a function of the first n minus one generalized velocities. And then pn. So pn is a, because it's a constant, so we treat it not like it's a variable that changes in time. So it's not really part of our phase space anymore. It's more of a parameter. Meaning something that as we vary, it will change the dynamics. And how is this related to the Lagrangian? Well, we do Pn times Qn dot minus L. So it looks a lot like the Hamiltonian. Right, but we, instead of subtracting off all of the coordinates and uh, time rates of change, we've just uh, subtracted off the ignorable one. So what, what do we get here? We get something that is, we get a function r. It's a function of all the non-ignorable coordinates and uh, their velocities. And the equations of motion look, look a lot like Lagrange's equation. So just like we would refer to Lagrangian equations, these are called the Routhian equations of motion. They look like Lagrange's equations. So d by dt partial r partial q i dot, the total der derivative of that minus partial r partial q i equals zero. But this is only for the non-ignorable coordinates. So the index i goes from one to n minus one. And so that's why I say it, we get a system of equations that looks effectively like we've reduced one degree of freedom. We use the fact that we had conservation of momentum in a direction and used it to get a reduced order model. In some sense, this is a very systematic way to get a reduced order model. So there's this whole field of uh, mathematical mechanics called reduction theory. And I think this would be like one of the simplest examples. You use conservation of momentum and uh, in a particular direction, and then you get a, effectively one less degree of freedom. Now, in, in this case, I, I assumed that I only had one ignorable coordinate, but this procedure generalizes to, um, you know, as many ignorable coordinates as you have. So this generalizes to, and I'll just use, you know, let's say we had more than one, I'll say S, S ignorable coordinates. And then let's say we grouped them, right? So that the last S coordinates were the ignorable ones. Then you could write this down and instead of this going from I to N minus one, it would go from I to N minus S. The sum, there'd be a sum here. So it wouldn't just be the last one, PN times QN dot. It'd be the sum of the last three. So this generalizes and you get effectively reduction from n degrees of freedom down to n minus s degrees of freedom. I keep saying effectively because these 
the dynamics in the n minus s degrees of freedom still do depend on that on the uh, momenta. They'll show up as parameters. So it's um, it's like you've got a s um, s parameters that describe your 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 routhian, and for each one, you you have a different um, n minus s degree of freedom system, and they'll be related. The system might also even conserve energy, total energy. So if you've got total energy conserved and then S uh, conserved momenta, you could really simplify your analysis of the problem. So this has been tried on a lot of uh, orbital mechanics problems, especially ones that deal with the expansions of the gravity field, like the motion of a uh, particle around the earth or satellite around the earth. Um, under the influence of J2, right, the bulge of the Earth. And then there's also, there's other Js that have to do with other spherical harmonics of the inhomogeneous distribution, mass distribution. And they all look like um, they're potential energies. Um, and this has been used to analyze, I know at least the J2 problem and possibly others. Or if you have an, an asteroid that's spinning and seems to have close to particular symmetry to the, to the body, then you could use this procedure as well. It's been used in more than just orbital mechanics. I'm just more familiar with that. So this is nice. Um, if you have an, an ignorable coordinate, and sometimes you might have an ignorable coordinate and not know it. And that's where this can be sort of a bummer. So I'm gonna give you an example where there's an ignorable coordinate, but you wouldn't know it by just taking a naive choice of coordinates. So let me give, give that example. I mean, there's, there's many I could choose, but I'll choose this one. I'm just gonna use a two degree of freedom system. I'll do the, the Kepler problem. So the Kepler problem is, um, well, we'll formulate it this way. We, just, we have a, a, a mass, think of the Earth, and then a satellite that has um, a trivial mass I'll say, you know, this is M equals, and I'll just use unit mass so they don't have to carry around M everywhere. So this has unit mass, uh, capital M is, is very large, and we're looking at uh, the motion, the gravitational motion of little m in the field of big M. Then we would, we could use, our first choice would probably be uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? So we're trying to Describe the vector r. Where is the, the small mass? And Cartesian coordinates would do the trick. So if we were to write down the Lagrangian, we'd first need to write the kinetic and the potential energy. So what have we written here that the uh, location of little m with respect to big M is this vector r. And if we write it just in terms of Cartesian components, right, q1 and q2. So the kinetic energy of this, remember I've set um, the mass of the, the small body equal to one. So this would be one half m, but that's just one. Q1 dot squared plus Q2 dot squared. And then the potential energy is, since it's the Kepler problem, it's one over uh, R, the way we usually put it, one over the distance. And so what is that? Square root of Q1 squared plus Q2 squared. And so I'm also setting like the gravitational parameter equal to one, if you want. So that just means like a rescaling of time and whatever. 
if we were to write the Lagrangian for this, right, T minus V, well, it doesn't, um, there are no ignorable coordinates, right? It's a function of, it's explicitly a function of Q1 and Q2. And of course, their time rates of change. So too bad. This must not have any uh, ignorable coordinate and therefore no conserved momentum. So because, yeah, because we see explicit dependence on both Q1 and Q2. There's no ignorable coordinate. But then you might say, hang on, you have some familiarity with the Kepler problem. Isn't there some conserved momentum? Does, it, does anybody know? <laughs> Wasn't it conserved angular momentum? Yeah. Yeah. So the there is a conserved angular momentum. So little h, um, this is r cross v. So if that's r, and then um, what's v? V is, I mean, the, the velocity. And I'm only writing it as a scalar h because if you, I'm writing it as a cross product, but then uh, what is this? Q1, Q1, um, is it Q2 dot, Q2 dot, I think, minus Q2, Q1 dot. That ends up being a conserved quantity if you calculate it. So this, this is a constant of the motion. And it's the it's the angular velocity. In fact, in this case, this is just the amount of the angular velocity, or not angular velocity, angular momentum. But it's not revealed by this choice of Cartesian components. If we happen to have used the of polar coordinates, we would have seen this. Right. So if we use If we use polar coordinates, R and theta, um, like the scalar R, and then this angle is theta. And if we use that to write the Lagrangian, so the kinetic energy, when you use polar coordinates, this is R dot squared plus R squared theta dot squared. And the potential energy is just negative one over R. And now, um, if we put the Lagrangian, right, the Lagrangian is T minus V, but we would see that it's, um, it is not explicitly a function of theta. It's a function of all the other variables, but not theta. So then according to what we talked about up above, theta is an ignorable coordinate. Theta is an ignorable coordinate. So that means P sub theta, partial L, partial theta dot, is a constant of motion. In fact, it's the same as this uh, H, which is R cross V. So it's, uh, it's constant angular momentum. So this is, this sort of shows um, in some sense, the liability of the um, ignorable coordinate approach is that it depends on what you chose as your original coordinates, right? That's one of the nice things about the Lagrangian formalism is you're not stuck with just using one set of coordinates. 
You can use any generalized coordinates that describe your system. Here, we could have we used Cartesian. Uh, we don't see any ignorable coordinate. If we use polar, then oh, then we do see. So that's you know that's good. So we've got this constant angular momentum. Uh, what is partial L partial theta dot? If we work it out, so P theta equals partial L partial theta dot is R squared theta dot. So the only dependence comes from the kinetic energy. So we know then that that is equal to a constant. So this means R squared at any time T and theta dot at any time T is equal to what it is at the initial time. So we can say R squared at time zero and theta dot at time zero, which then we can, we can rewrite because right, theta dot is D theta DT. So this gives us in some sense, the, the equation of motion for that ignorable coordinate, instead of being second order, like we would typically get, it ends up being first order. So I'm just rewriting this, d theta dt equals, and you know, right, what is this? This is the, um, it's the value of the angular momentum at time zero. So it's the constant value of the angular momentum so we've got the constant value of the angular momentum that comes from in initial conditions. And then this is divided by R squared theta. So we have, this is um, giving us the dynamics. So the dynamics of theta, the ignorable coordinate, are only first order in time rather than the usual second order that we would get from Lagrange's equations. Right, Newton's laws, you've got F equals M A, A is the second derivative. So um, this is something that you generally will get is that the dynamics for the ignorable coordinates is first order. And sometimes these are called, although maybe this is getting into the weeds, this is because you don't really need to know theta to find out the dynamics of R. This is called the reconstruction equation. Because if you wanted to reconstruct what the dynamics of theta were, well, you, you can, um, but in some sense it is, it's been uncoupled from what the dynamics of R of the, the radial direction. How would we get the dynamics for the radial direction where we, we would use the procedure up above of defining the Routhian, which would be um, P theta, theta dot minus L. And this is going to give us a, a Routhian, which is just a function of R, R dot. And then it'll have this parameter corresponding to the angular momentum. And then if you use Routh's equations, you'll get something that's you know r double dot plus dot 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 equals zero. So you get something that's second order. That's the key thing. The non-ignorable coordinate has second order dynamics for all the non-ignorable coordinates. Just like they usually do for Lagrange's equations, meaning second order in time, the highest derivative is second order. That's what I mean by second order dynamics. And from that, you would, you could, from the initial conditions, you know, R theta, uh, sorry, R time zero and R dot at time zero, you could find out what is R at any time T, right? You would be simulating something that looks like effectively a one degree of freedom system in the radial direction. And then if you wanted to, you could reconstruct what theta was as well. So then you can get R and theta. Um, my main point here with this Kepler problem example was that if we had naively chosen Cartesian coordinates, we wouldn't know 
that there was an, an ignorable coordinate. It's and are we going to like try all possible coordinates? I guess when you have like a particle in the plane, there's really two choices that people commonly use: Cartesian or polar. If you have a higher dimensional system, though, maybe it's it's uh, you can't just sort of go through all possible sets of coordinates. So this this reveals a a problem that. In the Lagrangian formalism, there's no systematic way. I guess, except for an exhaustive search, that doesn't seem very systematic. There's no efficient systematic way to find ignorable coordinates. There's a little bit of luck involved. And this is mechanics, should be rigorous. We don't want luck to be dictating things. So this is um, one of my compare and contrasts. So in comparison to that, in the Hamiltonian formalism though, there is a systematic way. Like you could at least make some headway rather than just random guessing. Um, and in theory, and, and this is what's kind of amazing. In theory, you can do a change of variables to a new set and by a new set, I mean a new set of Qs and Ps where all the coordinates are ignorable. And they're, they're, your mind should be blown, like, whoa. Meaning, okay, if you started with some Qs and Ps, you could find a transformation to a new set, and I'll call them capital Q and capital P. And these are each n-dimensional. And in the new set, pi dot equals zero for all of the i's. So that seems pretty powerful. And because the pi dots are con, it doesn't mean that the Q dots are constant but they will evolve in a um, pretty simple way. And this is, I think I had referred to it earlier. Um, I call these action angle variables. Or maybe it wasn't clear that it had anything to do with ignorable coordinates, but these are called action angle variables. And sometimes you don't get quite to this level where pi dot equals zero. You might get that pi dot is small. Meaning you have a set of variables where the Qs of, might evolve on a, a, a fast time scale. And those are the things called the angles. And then the actions evolve on a, on a uh, very long time scale. So they change slowly. That's a lot better than probably your, your original set of Qs and Ps where everything was evolving at basically the same time scale. You can transform to this new set where the uh, Ps evolve not at all or very slowly, and then the Qs evolve very quickly in a rather simple way. So that's, that's nice. <laughs>